you Chad because if it's not I've really got myself into a hole me too okay so <laughs> so appreciate the ministry of Chad and Erica as they go upstairs and they help the kids learn the same message that we hear down here and we are uh, one I want to welcome those that are joining us we talked about some of those folks that are struggling in prayer and some of them are online so welcome to you watching online we're in Romans chapter 12. This is the final message of our one anothering series. That doesn't mean we only have five one another things to do. It really means that we are only going to look at five, and I'll come back at another time, and we will look at five or six more. The reason I wanted to cut this message short was because I have been listening to what I've been saying. And <laughs> I do listen to what I say. I try, honestly. And uh, I have noticed a lot of what I think about and sometimes talk about, friends, is all the things that I don't have. I used to be able to. I used to be able to. I used to be able to. And I found myself saying, what am I thankful for? And Thanksgiving is only three or four weeks away, four weeks away. So I'm going to start a three-week series on an attitude of gratitude. What do we have to be thankful for? Because... Friends, I'm tired of complaining about all the things I don't have. I want to start being thankful for what I do have. And so that's where the thrust of this series for the next couple of weeks is going. Uh, as we lean into Thanksgiving. Hi. You come here often? <laughs> oh, man, I just lost lunch. Uh, <laughs> and uh, after... I'm so thankful for my wife. She is so patient. That's how I'm going to start off. And then uh, after Thanksgiving, I'm going to walk in through a series of, uh, I think I'm going to call it Back to the Future, as we look at the prophecies of Christ and then how they were fulfilled and why they're important. And that'll take us into January. So that's what's coming down the pike for the next seven to eight weeks. Christmas is only eight weeks away. Wow. Praise God, 2020 is almost done. All right. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go into one another. I've stalled long enough. You have a quiz. If you can pass your quiz, you'll be out before noon. If you don't pass your quiz, I'm going to go back and re-preach all four messages because you didn't listen. All right, so no pressure. All right, week one, we talked about Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, and we are to what one another? Bear, yes, some of you don't want to stay. Bear with one another. We are to temporarily lift the burden from someone that has a burden that they did not see coming. We are not called to carry that for them. We are called to help them because we have our own burden to bear. All right, good. You're one for one. Next week, we talked about what one another. Yes, we are called to love one another. And love is to the decision to compassionately responsibly and righteously pursue the well-being of another person regardless of how you feel about me and how i feel about you i am to pursue your well-being all right side note before we get into week three uh good news and bad news is the good news is randy and i studied out of the same textbook this week the bad news is randy and i studied out of the same textbook this week and half of the verses that he used for Sunday school are going to sound really familiar here in the next 15 to 20 minutes as I walk through this message. All right, let's keep going. We are two for two. Next week, we talked in Hebrews chapter 10 about not forsaking the gathering. So what are we to do with one another? We are to, we are to encourage one another. You're right. Yes, we're to encourage. We live by encouragement and we die without it slowly, sadly, sadly, and with much anger. All right, here's the big one. If you pass this, we can keep going. Are you nervous? Great, no one's nervous. And last week, we looked at what are we to do with one another from Romans chapter 12. We are to... Oh! Oh! We 
We are to huh? be devoted. Very good. Good for you. We are to be devoted to one another. What? How do I show devotion in 2020? We talked about not loving like a hypocrite, about showing the right love language. We talked about being patient and rejoicing and always being in prayer. And then we meet, need to meet each other's needs. All right. We're going to finish that study in Romans. This is part two. So if you want to get to Romans chapter 12, Romans is the greatest theological document ever written. This is not light reading for you to read before you go to bed. It's going to make you or hopefully cause you to think and hopefully go, I don't understand. And it's going to be that way because this is a very deep and very complex book. Paul wrote the, to help us to understand the truths revealed in Christ. Because of what Christ has done, this is how we are to live. And it helps us deal with the problems of this world because we are to be in this world, but we are not to be of this world. And then finally, last week we looked at those family obligations. And this week we're going to look at the non-family obligations, all right? So if you're looking for a title for this message, I entitled this message, How Do I Interact with Unbelievers? Because we are to, we have been focusing the last four weeks on how do I work with one another. The question I have this morning is how do I interact with the world that doesn't believe in God? Because we are called to be in this world, but we're also called to not be of it. This passage makes a whole lot of sense in light of Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Let's go on a road trip to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind. All right, so we need to transform the way that we think. We need to transform the way we behave. And in light of that, we're going to lean into Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. All right, let's get there. And verse 14, it says, bless those who persecute you. So the first thing we need to understand is this is persecution of the physical side of pain and torment. So Paul tells the people that he's writing to, the Romans, he says, I want you to bless. What does it mean to bless? It means to speak well of. I am to speak well of those that bring me physical pain and physical discomfort. That is a complete transformation to what the world has done. If you are going to insult me, my reaction, my flesh reaction, is I'm going to insult you back. Paul says, time out. That's not what we're to do. We are to bless. We are to speak well of. We are actually to treat them as friends. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless them and do not curse. I am to not curse him. Cursing is to speak harshly, to strike out, or to overreact to them. So if you hit me, I'm going to hit you back when I was younger. Someone write this down because somebody needs to call DHS. When I was younger, my dad used to play this game with me. And this game was called the hitting game. And I said, and nothing can go wrong with this, right? So my dad would say, let's play a game. Let's see who can hit the lightest. So I said, okay, I bet you I'll win. So I walked up to him and I would barely just tap him. And then you know what my dad did in love? Oh, yes, he did. He went back and just pounded me. Not in the face, just in the arm. And he'd go, oh, guess I lost. So you know what I did? Yes, you're right. I went and I cried to mom. And dad got in trouble. <laughs> so dad came up the next time. He goes, hey, you want to play a game? I said, sure. He goes, you want to play it? Let's play the hitting game. And I said, certainly he would do that again. So I went and I tapped him and he goes, bam, and he knocked me a good one. He did it again. So I did the only thing I knew what to do. Again, I went and I told mom and dad got in trouble. Again, the third time he would play, and I'm not saying days, I'm talking weeks, months, even years. So eventually I got older, and as I got older, that game was played less and less. So one time he said, you won't play the game, I said, if I go first, if you go first, so he went first, and I think I, I lost that time. So what all that to say, I am not to get angry with those that persecute me. I am not to curse them. What am I to do? I am to bless them. 
to not retaliate evil for evil, but to look at them, to speak well of them. Those that are causing me physical pain and suffering, I am not to retaliate. I am to speak well of them. I am to pray God's blessings upon them, that they would come to have the opportunity to know what Jesus has done for them. That is the complete transformation of what we would do in our natural self. Two verses I want to take you to because this should sound familiar. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Jesus said this. Jesus said, but I say you love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. What I love about Jesus is that he didn't just say it. He actually went and did it. Luke chapter 23. He's hanging on the cross. After his faulty trial, after his flogging, after his crown of thorns, after everything they did to him, Jesus hanging on that cross, if anyone has the right to say, get him, God, Jesus does. And Jesus turns to him and he says, God, he says, Father, forgive them. In my flesh and in myself, in a moment of vulnerability to you, if I'm hanging there, I'm saying, God, are you writing down every name of every person that's here? Because I want you to get them and you make them suffer. But Jesus looks at them and says, pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you. And he says to them, Father, forgive them because they don't understand what they are doing. Let's keep going. Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. We are to have empathy with people. Now, this is to be those that rejoice, we're to be happy with. Those that we, for those that are suffering, we are to suffer with. To have empathy is to, not through manipulation, not going up to there and demean them, oh, you must have had a bad day, but to honestly consider what they're going through. And we are to rejoice with those that are having a good day. And we are to weep with those that are having a really hard time. Now, this is tough. And if, if we're going to be honest this morning, this is really difficult when you get passed over for that promotion. And the person that you despise the most got the promotion. Scripture tells us we're to be happy for them. And when those that we passed over, that guy or gal that just kind of digs it into us and makes us angry, and they're weeping, we are to honestly, with good empathy, weep with those that weep. This is a great opportunity for us to show the compassion that God has given to us. One of the passages that I have been so much in love with during this pandemic is Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2, you know the story of Job. If you don't, really quick, Job is, is a very wealthy man. He has everything that all of us all, that we all want. And then he loses it all within a day. And all that's left is him and his wife. And his wife turns to Job and says, Job, just curse God and die. Job lost everything. He lost his children. He lost his kids. He lost his cattle. He lost his house. He lost his possessions. He lost it all. He lost everything. And yet here comes Job's friends. What do you say to a guy that lost everything? I don't know. But this is a great example of what Job's friends did. Job chapter 2. And when they, Job's friends, they raised their eyes from afar. They're coming to see Job. And they did not recognize him being Job. And they lifted their voices and they wept. Their friend, his friends, they just cried. They showed great empathy because Job was having great sorrow. And each one, each of his friends, they tore their robe and they sprinkled dust in their head towards heaven. This is a sign of great mourning and of great sorrow. Not out of a, oh, you're so sad. This is out of my friend hurts. And because he hurts, I hurt. So they sat down with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word. Let me say that again. No one spoke a word. If you don't know what to say, then just sit down and cry with them. Because sometimes there's nothing to say. 
And we don't want to come into a situation like this and end up saying the wrong thing and causing more hurt. So Job's friends, they sat there for seven days, didn't say a word. And they sat there and cried with him, for they saw that his great his grief was great. So we want to weep with those that weep, and we want to rejoice with those that rejoice. President Teddy Roosevelt, he said it this way. He said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Job's friends, they knew that he, they cared for him because of the great care that they had. My first question for you, if you're taking notes this morning in the bulletin is, people know my opinions. We're in a day and age that we have all kinds of opinions. opinions. But do people know that I care? Oftentimes, I'm so quick to tell you what I think before I tell you or before I demonstrate that I care. The first two things of how I can interact with this unbelieving world or with an unbeliever is I'm so quick to tell them that they're wrong. But if I would take time and genuinely care for them as an individual, that's going to cause them to pause. And it's going to cause them to say, that's not how everyone else treats me. That's different. Why are you different? Well, I'm different because I have been transformed. Why have you been transformed? <laughs> Funny you should ask. You have five minutes, ten minutes? I want to meet you. I want you to meet a man named Jesus. And then you lay out the gospel. But people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And in this climate, in this day and age, I can tell you my opinion. But I need to come to hear my opinion. And when we go out into the world and we interact with the world, people want to know that they care. Because there's a world right now that is suffering. There's loneliness. There's depression. There's anxiety. There's drug overdoses. People are hurting. And it's an opportunity for us to step into that hurt and say, I care about you. I don't know how to fix it, but let me sit down and cry with you. Not to manipulate you, but because of the great loss that you are suffering. Let's keep going. All right, let's go to verse 16. Second thing I want to do. Be of the same mind towards one another. All right, so now some of you are looking at this going, wait a second. I can't be like the same mind towards one another because my mind has been transformed. You would be right. Paul here, he takes it from from how I've studied it as a looking at how do we interact with an unbeliever to now he shifts back to the unbeliever. So if I could, and don't misunderstand this, I would take this these next couple verses and I would put it into last week's message because it's more of how I interact with you. It's more of how I interact with another believer. So I am to be of the same mind towards one another. I am to seek harmony with you. I am to be of the same mind with you. All right, let's go to a couple passages. John chapter 10. I'm going to reference them if you want to turn there. The devil comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. The devil wants nothing more than for us to be disunified. The devil wants nothing more than you and I to be fighting with one another within this church. Because if we're fighting with one another... I'm focused more on you, and I'm not focused on the goal of what we're here to do. And if I'm focused more on you and watching my back, then I'm certainly not focused on taking the gospel out. And if the devil can come in and stir that pot and cause dissension, then the church is off vision and the church is off purpose, and we're fighting with one another. So the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that, he, that we may have life, that we may have unity. All through the New Testament, it talks about the importance of unity. And it's been a really hard time for the church, not necessarily our church, but the church in general to be unified. Because there's a lot of things pulling at us for division. We've talked about this before in this series. We've talked about how many of us come in and we have come back together. Just a side note, from my viewpoint... I come in and I say, we haven't been together since March. A lot has happened in March. 
we left here and the pandemic was not really that big. It was gonna be two weeks. And then we waited and waited and waited and then something else happened that caused a lot of division. And that's the politics. And so now we come back together and we have all of this different viewpoints and all of these opinions coming back into the building. We need to be unified. We need to have the same mind towards one another. We need to see harmony. John 13, 35. The world will know you're my disciples if you love one another. So be in the same mind, have the same harmony, or have the harmony with each other. Do not set your mind on high things. Watch the pride. Watch, be careful of your pride. And I say that to myself, be careful of my pride. I need to watch because I come in and I always think I'm right. And you come in and you always think you're right. But we need to watch the pride. Don't set your mind on high things. Don't set your mind on prideful things. But associate with the humble. We need to make sure we continue to reach out. We need to make sure we continue to, to minister to those that are not like us. If you want a side note, you want a little bit of homework this afternoon to study, we can go to James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. We're not to show favoritism. I'm not to look at one person and say, oh, because you are looking that way, I'll spend more time with you. Because you look that way, I'm going to spend less time with you. I am to associate with all people. Associate with the humble people. Many times I have sat in your many of your homes, and I have wept with you, I have prayed for you, and I have said, what can I do to help you with my hands or my feet? And many of you have said, not in these exact words, but with this, if you will, this idea or this intent. When I look around and I look at others that are suffering, it keeps my mind on Christ because I don't have it nearly as bad as someone else. At least I don't have this wrong. And we continue to keep our mind set on one another. We continue to have harmony. So don't set your mind on things above. I'm sorry, don't set your mind on high things, on pride. But associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Make sure you have people around you to give you the other side and the other point of view. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Why? Because of Romans chapter 12, verse 9. What am I to do with evil? I am to abhor evil. What does abhor mean? I am to hate. And that is a very strong emotion. But I am to hate what is evil. If I run away from something, what am I running to? I'm running to good. So I am to not repay evil for evil. Well, it says that in verse 14, right? In Romans chapter 12, verse 14, I am to bless those who persecute me. I am to bless them and not curse them. So you see here, I am to repay no one evil for evil. Don't return evil for evil. If someone's persecuting you, don't re-persecute them. Don't go and do what they have done to you. Do the opposite. Why? Because we've been transformed. Our minds are different. So the question I have for you this morning is, which is winning? Love or revenge? Which is winning for you this morning? Love or revenge? Maybe you're sitting here saying, I can't wait till they do this or till this happens. When they finally get a flat tire in that brand new truck, I'm not going to help them. I'm going to honk my horn, drive by them and wave because they got a better truck than I did. Or if it's a job, or if it's a house, or if it's something else. So often, friends, we're so focused on making sure we end up better that we don't allow love to win. So the question I have for you to wrestle with this morning is when I interact with an unbeliever, someone that doesn't believe, is my first response revenge? Let them suffer. Or is my first response, does my heart break? Because I was once there. And if you're a believer, there was once a time that you were not a believer. And someone loved you enough and was compassionate enough to you 
to tell you the truth of God's word. So which one's winning for you this morning? Love or revenge? Let's keep going. Verse, uh, verse 18. If it is possible. Now we all know somebody that likes to fight. No matter what you say, they're going to say the opposite. If you say up, they'll say down. If you say left, they'll say right. If you say green, they say black. If you say Republican, they say Democrat. If they say Democrat, they'll say Republican. They just want to stir the pot. You ever know those people? Anybody have anybody in their life? Okay, great. I'm the only one. <clears throat> we all have people that just like to cause conflict. So Paul tells us, if it is possible, two things here. This is a relationship. There are some relationships that you're going to have that people just want to stir the pot. They just want to be in there to continue to have conflict. We, as believers, are supposed to do all that we can. All right, so if it is possible, as much as it depends upon you, a relationship is two ways. It's me to you and you to me. My relationship with you is to be marked with peace. One commentator, he put it this way. He said that the road to a relationship should be paved with peace. That we should allow ourselves to have a peaceful road of relationship. So there is going to be people that no matter what we do, friends, they are going to be in conflict. So as much as I can do, as far as it depends upon me, have I done all I could do? Have I showed love? Have I not repaid evil for evil? Have I tried to show them goodness? Have I done all that I can do? Then if, uh, if you've done all you can do, it's as far as it depends upon you. If it is possible, as much as it depends upon you, live in peace with all men. Now this peace is not to sacrifice truth. When people walk around and they say mistruth, or they say a lie, and I'm saying around God's word, that is when the peace stops, and we need to stand up for what is right and what is true and found in God's word. This is not, this God's word right here, this is not an opinion. This is what we govern our lives by. But as far as it depends upon you, of, of opinions, not absolute truth, we are to live peacefully with all men. I try really hard. No more vulnerability with you. I try really hard not to get people upset with me. Especially, especially from the point. If you're going to be mad at me for something I say on this stage or behind this pulpit, ultimately I want you to be mad because it's, it's God's word. I don't want you to come on a Sunday morning and have this be like talk radio where I give you a bunch of opinions. You didn't come for my opinion. You came to hear God's word. And so we need to be at peace with one another as far as it depends upon us. And there's going to be certain things that we can say, and there's going to be certain things that we cannot say that we know is going to stir people up. So let's save that for what's going to make people upset for another time in another place. I am to live peacefully with you. Beloved, so who's he talking to? If I call you beloved, he's talking to believers. So you can say beloved or believers. Do not avenge yourselves. Don't wrath back. Don't retaliate. But rather give place to wrath, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Hey, if God doesn't get you this side, he's going to get you on the other side. But sometimes we want to see that vengeance from God on this side, don't we? We want to see people that have hurt us hurt and suffer. But we need to live with a kingdom mindset and an eternal perspective that God is going to get them. Don't you and I step in and be a judge? Because it's really easy for me to judge. It's really easy for me to retaliate. I am to allow God to do that. Let's keep going. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, because I'm not going to retaliate, because I'm not going to take revenge, <clears throat> I'm going to, if my enemy is hungry, what am I to do? I'm to starve him out. I'm to make him suffer even more. Is that what scripture says? No. My enemy is here, the one that has persecuted me, the one that has caused me physical discomfort. 
What am I to do? I am to minister to him. If he is thirsty, I am to give him a drink. You can last, uh, Jesus lasted 40 days without food. You can last three days without water. It's what science says. I've never tried it. But when we see someone suffering, we are not to enjoy their suffering. Even if it's the persecutor, we are to minister to them. That completely is counterculture. And the world's going to stand up and say, wait a second. I was down, and you had the opportunity to kick me while I was down. And instead of kicking me while I was down, you landed a hand to help me up. Why would you do that? Because that's what Jesus told me to do. Why would Jesus tell you to do that? Well, if you have five minutes, I'd love to tell you. It's counterculture. And what happens when I do good to my enemy? I'm going to heat coals of fire on their head. This is an ancient Egyptian custom. It goes back to when a person wanted to demonstrate public sorrow for their action. They would carry a pan of burning coals on their head. And that would be a way of representing the burning of the evil thoughts that were going out from among them. How would that look today if we all carried around pans on our head? That would be very interesting. How would those conversations go? I see you got another pan on your head. Rough week? That's really what we're doing. We want to make sure we have the opportunity to witness to people, even when they treat us poorly. Verse 20, therefore, oh, verse 20, the question is, am I loving those that persecute me? Am I loving those who persecute me? We don't face persecution as the Romans faced. We don't face persecution as those in the Mideast faced. Side note, November 1st, the first Sunday in November, is to remember the persecuted church Sunday. And we have people in this very day and age that have, that are facing persecution that we have never faced, and our prayer is that we never will face. But when we come into those who persecute us, are you loving them? Are you caring for them? Or are you secretly sitting at your dining room table saying, God, get them, and let me see it because I'll enjoy it? Are you praying for those? And are you loving those who persecute you? Because it's so easy for me to look at the world and say, you're so wrong. You're so wrong. But when's the last time my heart broke so much? I went out and I said, how can I serve you? In hopes that you would give me five minutes to tell you about a man that changed my life. Instead of saying, well, let him go. Pick up another curve and let him go. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. I would take it a step further, and I don't ever want to take away from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but I would say the gospel can do a lot. It can do all of it. The gospel drives out darkness. It brings in the light. The gospel drives out hate. And it brings in love because the gospel is love. And we are called to be salt and light. We are called to show the world that we are Christians. Because people need the Lord. What two great hymns were picked out for us. So the final question I have for you is, am I winning people to the Lord by my behavior? I'm very quick to tell my opinions. I'm working on that. I'm very quick to pass judgment. I'm working on that. But I asked myself this week, am I winning people to the Lord by my behavior? Are people drawn to Christ by how I am responding? Or are people looking at me going, if that's a Christian, I'm going in the exact opposite direction because I want to have nothing to do with them. Are you winning people to the Lord by how you are responding. It's a great way for one another, for the world, to show them the love of Christ. Let's close in a word of prayer. As you
settle your hearts and you pack yourself up to go and you prepare for communion, I don't want to miss an opportunity to pray for you. Is there anybody that here this morning that says, would you pray for me? Because people know my opinion. But not too many people know that I care. Would you pray for me that I could start to demonstrate my caring as much as my opinions? Would you pray for me this week? See that hand, thank you. See that hand, thank you. See that hand, thank you. Is there anybody here this morning that would say, would you pray for me? Because, to be really honest, I seek revenge more than love. And, this, and God's word has challenged me this morning that I need to allow love to prevail. Would you pray for me as God works in my heart? Thank you. I see that hand. Is there anybody here this morning that says, would you pray for me because I'm not loving those that are treating me poorly? Pray for me that I can love those. I see that hand. Thank you. Is there anybody here that would say, would you pray for me because I want my behaviors to bring people to the Lord, not charge people? One hand, two hands. Lord, I'm so thankful for your word. Lord, we need to one another. We need to bear with one another. We need to love one another. We need to encourage one another. We need to be devoted to one another. We need to have harmony with one another. And Lord, we do this so we have the opportunity to share the love of Christ. So Lord, give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. And give us hearts to understand that we can interact with the world and show them by how we love them. Lord, I pray for those that are saying, people know my opinions. Lord, help them help them to be able to show people that they care. Lord, we want love to win out, not revenge. Lord, we want to be able to draw people in a loving relationship with you by our behavior. Lord, help us to be mirrors of Christ. Help us to be the moon and reflect the sun by how we interact during such a, a critical time, a very interesting time where people are seeking to know what is happening. May we be able to point to Christ and give them hope during a time that seems hopeless. Lord, help us to always have love with you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right, well, it's the first Sunday of the month, and we're going to transition to communion. So hopefully you have a communion pouch in front of you. On that communion pouch, if you would look at it, there is going to be the bread or the cracker or the wafer. We're going to take that first, and then underneath is going to...